Buonasera, benvenuti al centesimo incontro del Giug Milano. Questa volta mi prendo un minuto io per dirvi una cosina un po' carina, perché correva l'anno 2009 e io partecipavo al 32esimo incontro del Giug Milano, che è stato anche il mio primo incontro. Insomma, sono quasi passati 10 anni, 100-32, ditemi voi quanti incontri ci sono stati, un po' li ho saltati, ma chi se ne frega. E... E volevo boh, pass- prendermi un minuto per ringraziare tutte le persone che... Eh, credo non ci sia nessuno, ma fa niente, che, che sono, hanno deciso di venire a tutti questi incontri e grazie mille, ho incontrato un sacco di persone diverse, ho eh, cambiato una marea di lavori, ho fatto networking, ho conosciuto un sacco di amici e quindi vi ringrazio, è stata proprio una bella esperienza e io ringrazio attualmente gli amministratori attuali del Giug Milano che sono Mario, Francesco e Matteo, in ordine di seduta. E per averci dato una mano in quella che secondo me è un po' la golden age del Giug Milano, perché non so se avete notato, ma la mailing list fiorisce di, di, di discussioni interessantissime, e facciamo un incontro al mese e abbiamo degli ospiti internazionali, e stasera c'è anche il Prosecco! Yeah. Di cosa si parla? Ah, il Prosecco non ci parla, il Prosecco si beve, ok? No, io ringrazio anche lo speaker Edson, per essere venuto fin qua dal Brasile, anche se adesso non vive più in Brasile, ma fa niente. Grazie mille Edson, e ci, porterà, ci porta una presentazione che secondo me è interessantissima, quindi spero bene. Abbiamo un po' di novità, e soprattutto abbiamo ricevuto i vostri feedback sull'open mic, e sappiamo che certe cose sono un po' migliorabili, certe cose no, stiamo provando di, stiamo provando a fare delle cose un po' interessanti, tipo trovare sponsorizzazioni, ma niente di troppo grosso, perché... A noi ci piacciono le robe organizzate dal basso, però lo stesso se arriva qualcuno e ci offre qualcosa, sponsorizza qualcosa, insomma non ci dà fastidio, insomma una cosa del genere. Stiamo provando un po' di robe, io vi ricordo sempre di iscrivervi alla mailing list, chi, di voi non è iscritto alla... chi è che di voi non è iscritto ancora alla mailing list? Bravi, questa è la risposta che voglio avere. E se volete, avere, se volete darci qualche feedback su come fare le cose, scrivete pure in mailing list che noi vi recepiamo sempre. Allora adesso lascio la parola a Gianluca. Che dove, dove cavolo è? Che è sparito? Ecco, Gianluca, che non hai applaudito per il centesimo incontro del governo. Ah, una informazione di servizio importante, eh, oltre al brindisi abbiamo anche i pasticcini. Quindi per piacere fermatevi e eh, eh, festeggiate con noi. Sì, adesso passo la parola a Gianluca. Ciao a tutti, solita presentazione. Chi è che non l'ha vista? Ragà. Tutti l'avete vista, sta presentazione, sempre il solito Shiba, perché, perché sono affezionata di Shiba. Vabbè, ehm, piacere, chi non mi conoscesse mi chiamo Gianluca, così mi trovate su internet, e così sto quando faccio le presentazioni, oggi compreso. Eh, questo è quello che faccio di lavoro, sono un programmatore, ma basta parlare di me, parliamo della cosa un pelo più, più tricky, lo spazio, cos'è questo spazio? È un co-working, no? Tipo Talent Garden, co-working, no, no, ok? Questo qua non è un co-working. Questo è l'ufficio di un paio di aziende, la principale è Mica Mai, che lavora in ambito principalmente web, eh, nasce nel 2007 su queste due cose in rosso, il rubino sta per Ruby, linguaggio di programmazione che viene dal Giappone, Rails è il framework di sviluppo web più famoso scritto in Ruby. In realtà Mica Mai lavora anche con altre tecnologie e lavora un po' con queste, questi clienti, no? più o meno come, come tipologie, giusto per farvi capire, ramo gaming, un po' di finance e moda. In realtà però qui dentro mica mai da, da, non è da sola, qui dentro mica mai lavora con altre aziende partner, una di queste è LinkMe che fa lo stesso lavoro di mica mai ma con delle altre tecnologie, altra azienda è Jack Magma e a questo punto c'è un po' una new entry, ok? Perché qui dentro queste aziende non sono, sono da, da sole, mettiamola così, ehm, ma in termini di community, di eventi come, come questo, non sono da sole perché... Amica Mai, Jack e Link mi si è, si è unita a questa nuova azienda, che è l'azienda per cui lavoro io, che in qualche modo cerca di eh, dare una mano alle community, ok? Credimi è una startup, lavora in ambito fintech e per intenderci fa anticipo fatture. Credimi insieme a Amica Mai, Jack e Link mi, eh, per questo motivo mette a disposizione un servizio che è un po' quello che state fruendo voi adesso. 
eh, molto banalmente si spostano un po' di tavoli, si dà lo spazio e eh, si dà il supporto per le community in maniera totalmente gratuita, a gratis. Perché? Per questo, ok? Perché ci piace farlo. Eh, so che sembra tanto una super cazzo, dice ah il cuoricino, vogliam vogliamoci bene. Raga, credetemi, è, è davvero per questo che, che si fa. Eh, non si fa per altro, lo dice pure Indy, quindi. Eh, la solita lista di, di eventi che abbiamo ospitato e che è estremamente poco aggiornata. Fra questi eventi c'è, e community scusate, c'è il Giug Milano e stasera ragazzi il centesimo anniversario, quindi a maggior ragione grazie, 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 siamo davvero onoratissimi di potervi ospitare. Un'ultima cosa, eh, questa è la marchettata, la piazza gamba tesa, fra praticamente poco più di una settimana eh, qui dentro ci sarà una conferenza internazionale che si chiama Code Beam Light, si parlerà del mondo Beam, che è la virtual machine eh, su cui gira Erlang, Elixir e, altri, eh, e altre tecnologie, e quindi se siete interessati i biglietti ci sono ancora, iscrivetevi e passate qui. A questo punto io chiudo la presentazione, questa è la mia mail, sempre di mica mai, scrivetemi pure qui per quanto riguarda eventi e community e quant'altro. E a questo punto davvero mi, mi dilego e lascio la parola allo speaker che ha cose molto più interessanti da dirvi. Buona serata. Ecco scusate, ne approfitto per dare un po' di cose, vogliamo fare un minimo di spazio di open mic, come vi ho già un po' accennato prima, quindi prima dello speaker eh, non vuole essere necessariamente una pubblicità, ma più un, un modo alle aziende di, insomma, di fare un po' di networking, di, di rappresentarsi una cosa di questo genere. Eh, ehm, quindi io prima di far partire il talk, che ho chiesto a Ezio per piacere altri 5 minuti, e ci, ci verrebbe a presentare la, la, la loro azienda, il signor Pancotti, giusto? Corretto, prego. E, appunto, visto che è un modo alle aziende di presentarsi, eh, l'abbiamo già visto l'altra volta, questa volta cerchiamo di tenerlo un po, più, un po' più corto, in modo tale così da dare un po' più di risalto al, al talk principale, grazie mille comunque. Vi ricordo che è un open mic che vuol dire che tutti potete parlare, nel senso se avete bisogno, se volete raccontare qualsiasi cosa scrivete semplicemente in mailing list e, e vi sarà dato lo spazio disponibile senza problemi. Cerchiamo, cer tendenzialmente cerchiamo di tenere un incontro a presentazione in modo tale da non farlo più troppo pesante, però sempre, sempre aperti a feedback. Grazie. Scusate, Prego. io ho promesso a Mario di già stare in 5 minuti, per cui sarò veramente essenziale per non disturbare il, il, lo scopo fondamentale per cui siete qui. Allora, quello che vi presentare è questo, che è allo stesso tempo un prodotto e un'azienda. L'azienda ha, ha mh, base a San Francisco, però lo sviluppo l'abbiamo fatto a Milano. Di solito è l'incontrario, però eh, le, le cose invece questa volta sono andate bene, cioè tutto, il, tutto lo, il prodotto è stato sviluppato da noi, la nostra società si chiama Mate, però in realtà un gruppo di noi lavora a tempo pieno per questa società con sede a San Francisco. Tutto nasce da un'idea che si basa sulla cosiddetta psicologia positiva, è una branca della psicologia che studia il comportamento umano nell'ambito del gioco e, e del lavoro e la domanda fondamentale è come si può coinvolgere e ottenere la fiducia delle persone eh, nel lavoro utilizzando qualcosa di diverso dal denaro, quel che è il cosiddetto engagement, si è visto che le aziende dove le persone sono coinvolte hanno rendimenti dal punto di vista sia economico che di comportamento delle persone molto migliori. Sono velocissimo, tanto poi lo trovate sul, sul, su, sull'indirizzo che Mario ha pubblicato da qualche parte, trovate poi la presentazione, ve la potete guardare con, esatto, con calma. No? Quindi l'azienda ha una serie di problemi che possono essere risolti se si studia come, la, la, la gente, come mai la gente gioca volentieri mentre si rompe le palle quando lavora, non tutti ovviamente, no? però è abbastanza frequente. Ricordiamoci che il nostro è un lavoro particolare, noi quasi tutti facciamo il software per amore, ma la gente no, normalmente lavora per denaro. Poi qualcuno riesce anche a divertirsi, ma non sono molti. Cosa succede nel gioco? E qualunque gioco voi facciate eh, ha questi elementi al suo interno, li vediamo uno alla volta. Eh, no, li vediamo tutti insieme perché non, è, non, eh, non ha nessun effetto. Allora, sapete qual è l'obiettivo? Qualunque gioco facciate c'è un modo per vincere e un modo per perdere. Dal Tetris agli sparatutto, che cosa siete lì a fare vi è chiaro. 
c'è il feedback perché man mano che il gioco si evolve c'è un, un punteggio che sale di qualche tipo, c'è un rewarding, un, un, una gratificazione di qualche tipo che vi fa dire che state diventando sempre più bravi. I giochi, soprattutto i giochi più complessi, conducono poi anche a delle interazioni sociali, pensate ai Warcraft, questi famosi giochi no, di, di, di ruolo che, in cui si creano comunità internazionali, la gente paga per giocare, per comprare oggetti o, o servizi. Però attenzione, il gioco funziona se le sfide sono bilanciate dagli skill, cioè se uno cerca di giocare al massimo livello di un gioco, di solito dopo pochi secondi ha già perso, se invece parte nel modo giusto, man mano che... Eh, aumenta la complessità del gioco aumentano le sue competenze la sua capacità di giocare e quindi migliora e quindi ha un senso di miglioramento e, e questo senso di miglioramento è già una gratificazione di per sé dopodiché eh, le persone nel gioco hanno una nor normale e naturale predisposizione all'errore, sperimentano nuove soluzioni, nuove strade per vincere tanto non succede niente al massimo perdono, ripartono e ricominciano a giocare Mentre nella vita la gente è spesso terrorizzata, oddio se sbaglio poi chissà cosa mi fanno. E infine, durante il gioco le persone hanno normalmente il senso del controllo, cioè del fatto che le cose succedono perché loro le fanno succedere, non perché ci sono eventi eh, casuali. Se c'è una randomizzazione all'interno del gioco fa parte del gioco e quindi bisogna gestirsi l'evento imprevisto, però... Non, 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 non esiste la crisi economica o l'azienda la, che decentralizza da qualche parte. Nei giochi queste cose non succedono. Bisogna che eh, per ottenere quindi la motivazione intrinseca questi principi vengano riportati anche nelle aziende. E lo scopo di questo prodotto, che è poi software, eh, anche software, è metodologia, è formazione, quello che vogliamo, però dietro c'è anche un prodotto, è di aiutare le aziende ad adottare questi principi, cioè portare nell'azienda questi meccanismi propri del gioco che però se mutuati nell'ambito aziendale si ottengono un effetto di engagement, di, di coinvolgimento delle persone molto forti. Quindi cosa abbiamo fatto? Abbiamo scritto un'applicazione, un'app, questa è la fotografia, diciamo, lo snapshot di cosa si presenta, cioè uno ha di fronte a una domanda molto semplice, no? Eh, quanto ti aiuta a migliorare e lavorare qui, ne riceve due al giorno, in orari casuali, in pochi secondi risponde. Dietro queste domande c'è uno studio, eh, in realtà la costruzione di queste domande è stata fatta a Berkeley da dei neuroscienziati, quindi c'è dietro un, un meccanismo non banale. Eh, questi dati vengono poi raccolti dall'app, dall questo è, è un po' piccolo, vi ho, vi ho fatto uno snapshot più grande, in modo che si possa vedere meglio, Questo, questa dashboard che viene elaborata eh, usando tra le altre cose anche Drools del nostro grande Mario, eh, si occupa del posizionare le persone in quel quadrante in alto a destra, che è il quadrante cosiddetto del flow, le persone che sono nella striscia gialla vuol dire che hanno sfide bilanciate, vuol dire che sono abbastanza competenti rispetto a quello che fanno. Se sono viola, sono stressati, cioè gli si sta mettendo davanti delle cose che non sono capaci di fare. Se sono azzurre, sono eh, annoiati, sono troppo bravi per quello che stanno facendo. E questo già è un modo di misurare le cose. Poi ci sono quei sette pillars, quelli di cui vi ho appena parlato, quei sette elementi che nel gioco vengono riportati poi anche nel lavoro, e misurando i sette pillars è incredibile, bisognerebbe provare, noi oggi abbiamo 4500 persone che lo stanno usando, fotografano in maniera precisa il sentimento che le persone hanno nei confronti del lavoro. Sembra una, una scemata, cioè fare le domandine e poi dare le domandine e ricavare questi sette elementi, invece funziona. Si possono anticipare abbondantemente di missioni indesiderate, così come si possono intercettare situazioni di conflitti all'interno delle aziende, tante cose negative che si cerca di evitare. Non contenti, grazie a Drulse, mettiamo anche le raccomandazioni, vedete, nel, nel, ecco, in questo schema in alto a sinistra vedete tre raccomandazioni eh, di esempio, che poi vengono ulteriormente sviluppate nel senso, guarda che c'è questa situazione, prendi queste iniziative. Noi poi andiamo anche a tracciare se i manager le prendono veramente quelle iniziative, facendo a loro delle domande particolari per cui 
poi veniamo a sapere se le cose vengono, sono avvenute o no, quello che le abbiamo detto di fare. Eh, per, questa è una slide solo per voi, perché non, non la portiamo poi dai clienti, quali sono le tecnologie che ci sono dietro? Il back-end è scritto in Kotlin, poi c'è il solito Spring, Drools e Azelcast che velocizza tutto, in un'architettura un microservice sotto CAS. Eh, il front-end è in Angular, le mobile app sono mh, per, per il momento una sola nativa in Swift, eh, l'altra è ancora Ionic, ma dovremmo portare in Kotlin pure lei sotto Android, e sotto vedete il, il mio contatto, per poter andare avanti velocissimo abbiamo già questi clienti notate che questo prodotto eh, un anno e mezzo fa non esisteva proprio eh, a luglio ci siamo visti per la prima volta eh, io e il, diciamo, il, il creatore della metodologia e loro erano una società di consulenza che lavora negli Stati Uniti eh, su questi temi ma non avevano mai scritto una riga di software hanno, hanno chiesto a me di occuparmene e nel giro di un anno siamo arrivati a, a acquisire questi clienti. La cosa eh, attrae molto gli HR, le, le, le direzioni di risorse umane, di aziende anche abbastanza grosse. C'è dietro una serie di aziende molto più note negli Stati Uniti che da noi. Va bene, queste sono cose abbastanza marchettare, ve ne, vi, eh, ve le evito. Troverete poi nel PDF che potete scaricare eh, questi tre link eh, eh, diversamente da molte start up l'attività che viene fatta sui social è molto intensa per cui se vi diverte questa idea vi interessa questo tipo di argomentazione al di là del software parlo proprio del, dei concetti che ci sono dietro eh, che seguite questi, questi social che troverete un sacco di informazioni utili eh, conclusioni è uno strumento oggettivo e data driven riesce a prevenire e eh, predire le criticità, supporta formazione mirata al middle management. Aggiungo una cosa, eh, a breve eh, dovremmo avere degli importanti capital venture, le trattative sono ormai a, alla firma e quindi fra un po' verremo investito da un mandato dagli Stati Uniti, aumentate le risorse per lo sviluppo. E il motivo per cui vi ho parlato di tutto questo, se vi intriga questo fatto, vi piace questa tecnologia, e per qualche motivo volete cambiare l'attività che fate adesso, chiamatemi perché siamo molto interessati. Grazie. All right. Buonasera. Ah, I'm practicing my Italian, yeah? So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but the rest of the talk I'll have to do in English, uh, unless you can understand Portuguese. <laughs> no? Okay, then English it is. Oh, Portuguese? Okay, Brazilian Portuguese? Oh, even better. Okay, and I can talk for him and the other ones can do that. <laughs> yeah, but after uh, talking a bit with, with Italians and visiting other countries, Latin countries too, I just realized that Italian is, uh, Portuguese is the most different language in the Latin world. So yeah, that's why it's far, but I guess if you know Italian, um, Romanian, Spanish are not that far, French a bit, but Portuguese is very different. That's what I, I realized. <laughs> the, the words are very different in the, the vocabulary, okay? And has been an amazing week so far. I'm so happy that I was able to schedule my traveling to come drop by here in Italy for the first time. And the cappuccino here is really, really <laughs> very good. Lasagna, I had lasagna at Mario's house, it's really good. Pasta, uh, vino, vino rosso, molto buono. <laughs> and yes, that has been a very nice visit. But, yeah, we're going to talk a, a bit technical now. Uh, well, we have this really long title, but just saying that uh, I've been doing enterprise Java development in the past 20, 20 plus years. Okay, let's not count that. And uh, of course, in the beginning, I did the hard way. What I'm going to show you today, I don't expect you to be the whole truth about software development. How should we be doing software? 
But I've, I've collected many tips from the scars that I had in the past 20 years doing this, and I hope that the content I have to, to share with you today can help in your daily activities. So again, I don't think there's, I used to be much more dogmatic when I was young. Then I just realized that we can have many different opinions, different options to try to do the real thing that we should be doing, which is solving and, and improving people's lives with our code. So these days I prefer to be pragmatic. So I don't dig into discussions. If people have different opinion, I just respect all of that. I just believe that might be different ways of doing, and I hope that the way that I can, that I'll be able to show you today can help you too. My name is Edson Yanaga. I'm a Brazilian Japanese. Yeah, I know, not the typical Brazilian you would expect, but yes, so we have a lot in common. I have, in fact, my wife almost said that I'm Italian because I like to speak with the hands. <laughs> so I like to do the things. In fact, I have a question for you. Is it offensive I ask you to do this? No? no? It depends on the context. Yeah. Context? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you find it very funny, uh, people saying, doing this. And I told my, my son that I would ask you to take a picture, like doing this, because he was very <laughs> nice. And I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. Just in case you want to follow me, I tweet a lot about DevOps, microservices, Java, software craftsmanship, and anything software related. I think I usually tweet a lot about food. Uh, well, food I eat, okay? Not about cooking or something. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, and I work for Red Hat, which is a very cool combination. <laughs> At least I think that, okay? Uh, and it's a, a very unusual too. So, but it just proves that the world has changed a lot in the past years. In fact, uh, it's a very interesting way that uh, Microsoft gave me the MVP award because I helped them to build the Java support on their Azure platform. So after that, I became a technical advisor and we've been working together trying to prove to have another platform for us to deploy our Java applications. So that's, that's what I think is uh, very interesting. I also uh, want to give you a tip. I brought some physical copies of the book, but I released last year this book uh, by O'Reilly, Migrating to Microservice Databases. Uh, I've been, this has been uh, now about three year research that I've did, visiting many teams and developers worldwide, trying to figure out how they are dealing with the problem of breaking monoliths and distributing the data. So the very first step of this research was published on this book. So uh, Red Hat developers bought the royalties of the electronic version. So you want to get a free copy of the book, you can go to this full URL. Or if you want to, if you, if you don't want to type all of that, you go to my Twitter profile. The pinned tweet has a link to the ebook. But I have five physical copies today and we might find a way to raffle these things later. And I didn't know that in advance was, but I was so excited that this is the meeting number 100 from the Jug Milano, so congratulations. Not many Jugs can, can have like this amount of meetings because if you have like one per month, it would take like more than eight years to achieve that. So congratulations for keeping that. Many Jugs, they fall during the, the years. People stop like going to the meetings, but I can see you have a very strong community. So congratulations to all of you. And that's one of the reasons of oh. you. Right. That's why I'm very happy to be part of this party, to have pizza later. Oh, pizza is very good too. Okay, I forgot <laughs> to mention that. Pizza is good and we're gonna have, be able to have something. Uh, I didn't try the Prosecco yet, but I'm pretty sure it's much better than Brazil. Right? I always like to start my talks with this quote from Forbes. Now every company is a software company. You don't work for a bank, you work for a software company. You don't work for an industry, for a retailer. You work for a software company because software is changing the world that we live. Some people call this digital transformation. The, my preferred term is digital economy. Why is that? And I used to be one of the, those people that thought that economics and economy had everything to do about money. But after studying a bit of, uh, especially behavior economics and um, behavior psychology, 
I just realized that economics has nothing to do about money, but has everything to do about people. Because these guys, the behavior economists, economists, they study how people interact with each other in a system, and how can you change some restrictions on the system or the motivations on the system to make the system change from one state to the other. And we have my very, my very par powerful motivations for that. Can be money, can be hate, can be love and uh, power. So these are some motivations that people have. And I prefer to think that we can change the restriction of the system. We can change our world from one state to the other because we are motiva motivated by love. Because we want to change the world that we live for the better, for ourselves, for our family, for the people that we love and for the people that yet we don't know. And there was a time in my career, approximately 10 years ago, I was a software developer. I wasn't satisfied with the path that my career uh, took. I uh, was very frustrated. I even decided to try something else. I uh, didn't succeed, of course, yeah, because I realized that the only thing that I knew to do in my life was to do software. So if I wanted to keep doing what I did, I'd better do it for some special reason. So that's why I, I, I just decided that I wanted to improve people's lives with the software that I delivered. And, but after some years, I just realized that just doing that wasn't enough. That's why I decided six, seven years ago that not only doing better software, I would try to help people worldwide to try to deliver better software faster and more reliably. And that's why I'm so happy to be at this role at Red Hat where I can try to share the most possible amount of knowledge with developers because, I, because you, we are the people that are going to change this world for the better, right? You can have a choice. I think that if we're here trying to, to uncover better ways of delivering software, we already made the choice. I think you can help other developers to make this choice too. We want to change people's lives for the better, okay? We can make a choice. We can make people's lives miserable because we know how to make them miserable. We're very good on that. But we can also make the difference making people's lives better, okay? so. Uh, that's the, the message that I want to leave with you. And uh, I missed the, the time here, but this uh, about digital economy. Some of the largest software companies, soft, software uh, companies in the world are, are, are only exist because some of the largest companies in the world are software companies because they only exist because of software. The software that these companies are producing are changing the way that people interact with each other. The largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber. The largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world owns no inventory, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. This very bad content, if I, you ask me. But uh, these companies only exist of soft, because of software. And you can never uh, deny that. The software that these companies are doing are changing the way that we interact with other people. So we can do that with the software where we code every day. I know that many of you must be thinking, well, that CRUD form that I'm developing every day that I just get a Jira issue and just commit to my repo might not be changing people's life for the better. You bet that everything that you do can make a difference. And I bet also that you're not constrained to just doing this field uh, crud thing uh, every day. We can all make a choice, but if anything is worth doing, I think it's worth doing well, okay? And I also like to introduce myself as a software craftsman because I believe the software is a craft, not much like an engineering. And of course, you might make some, we might have some different, uh, different opinions about this analogy. But I like to think that software is a craft first because you never do the same software twice. If you're paid to do the same software twice, I'm pretty sure that the second time you will do that, you will do better, you would have more knowledge, you have better tools, different ways of doing, you would deliver something better, you would deliver something different. It's much like producing a violin. And I just learned that Stradivarius, for example, is Italian. Uh, well, I, I had, a, a, um, wrong um, idea of that. So we can all be producing these kind of things. And I've, uh, I like this quote very much. It's on the 
Computer Science Museum in Palo Alto, I guess, computer, uh, the Museum of uh, Computing History in Palo Alto, saying computer programming is an art because it applies accumulated knowledge to the world because it requires skill and ingenuity, and especially because it produces objects of beauty. There are very more, very few more beautiful things than that code that you just crafted, you just coded, commit the thing, and when you go at night during the bed, you think, no, today, uh, we, in Portuguese, we have an expression uh, that I don't know how to translate to Australian, but you know, né? Hoje eu mandei bem para cá. Yeah, but they're recording, okay? And yeah, it's a bad word. But like today, I was awesome. That's the feeling, you know? And sometimes we uh, people take that away from us. I think also that we can get it back, this feeling of being awesome, because today this code that I did is the best thing that I ever did in my life, except kids maybe, but uh, talking about code could, could be that. Yeah. Again, I like this quote from Management 3.0. No matter what other methods you apply to achieve com competence in a social system, in the end, it all depends on whether people actually care. Okay? You can have the best engineers, you can have the best tools, put a lot of money on that. People don't care about what they do. You never have a good result. Have some great books, and we can try to identify some code smells that encode that we develop every day. So, uh, how many of you have read Affected Java? Some clean code, also. Oh, we have a we have a very nice audience. So it's not just about domain-driven design, but all of these books they brought something that we can add in our daily activities. And I'm trying to wrap up uh, some of these tips and share with that we view today with uh, live coding. So some of the code smells that we're going to tackle is primitive obsession, the thing that we're just using the basic types of our language. Uh, we'll try to solve this problem. Uh, this article from Martin Fowler has more than 10 years when to make a type. And I strongly suggest you to read it because I triply released that to the public domain. So you can read it for free. Uh, you, but it just, just basically says that if you are in doubt, if you, should I create a type for this kind of abstraction or not? Then if you have a doubt, the answer is yes. Because it's much easier for you to remove a type later than try to introduce a type if you leak it all the abstraction for your code. No pointer exception. Uh, I once regretted, I uh, really wanted that James Gosling had removed the new pointers from the Java language, but I realized that more than 20 years ago, they didn't have an easy answer for that. I don't think they have uh, this year yet too. But uh, even if we have to, to deal with no pointer exceptions, I think that if we properly encapsulate and add some uh, abstractions of our code, we can remove bo bo uh, most of the occurrence of no pointer exceptions. If you go to Stack Overflow or try to Google that, you see the no pointer exception is by far the most common exception in the Java language. I think it might be the case in other languages too. So we, might, we should be able to try to avoid that. But enough of talking, I talk it a lot today, and I'm going to show some code right now. And just a disclaimer, in my role of the, uh, again, I've been developing Java software in the past 20 years, but in my role as a director of developer experience, I don't code as much as I want. I want, okay? So forgive me if I look like a bit rusty, but you can trust me, I've been doing this like for many, many years. So I didn't even want to delete my, my other code here because I thought that I wouldn't be able to get to, uh, back to the same points. But let's just enter presentation mode. And now I have to, to sit down. This is a default Java E application. I'm using uh, Wildfly Swarm. It has some capabilities, but the ones that I, I'm going to use right now, I just chose the Java E stack because, well, pretty much everybody knows the technology involved these days. So we're going to use JPA. We're going to create a domain model using standard POJO and some annotations. And we're going to use a, a web-based interface based on JFF, JSF. Some people love it, some people hate it. 
I honestly think that JSF is a wonderful solution for some very specific use cases and it's a terrible solution for all the other ones, just as any technology, right? If you have the right use case, I think it's uh, perfect. So let's try to create, I always try to create, let's start here with a model and First, uh, uh, since not many of you are aware of some domain-driven design abstractions, I have to tell you that that's the, uh, when we're talking about technical patterns on how should we implementing some things inside a domain-driven design model, uh, usually the most uh, relevant concept that you should be aware of are aggregates, entities, and value objects. So that's why I need to explain that. And the main difference between that at entities as we model them in, in our business model, is that entities evolve over time. And even if you change all the properties of an entity, it's still the same entity, which means that if I have a person class and I declare that to have an instance, uh, an instance with ID something, a thousand, and that uh, that person is Edson, surname Yanaga, and has age something, sex something, and all of the other attributes, all the attributes can change over time, but it's still the same person. So I could make a surgery, change sex, I could change address, I could have mistyped uh, the, my date of birth, I could change that, but it's still the same identity, right? So entities, they have identity. On the other hand, depending on the business model that you're creating, if you're creating a phone number, yeah, like if I have a phone number with uh, digits 222, I have another phone number instance with digits 222. It doesn't matter for my system unless you're modeling, for example, a, a telephone system. Shouldn't matter for you if you change this object with another instance with the same internal value. Like it doesn't matter for 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 your business domain application because uh, it, they're basically just exchangeable. So value objects are disposable and they are equal based on their value. But entities, they have an identity which lives until that instance dies, okay? And another uh, concept that we need to be aware of are aggregates. So we have entities. Usually entities are composed of value objects and associations to other entities. And aggregates are, again, usually they are considered to be the root of your bounded context. And bounded context is not something that I can just specify clearly on code because that's a business uh, abstraction. But basically think that if you have, you can create a scope in your code and that scope is self-contained, you can see that you, you, that, that scope is cohesive uh, enough uh, you can call that a bounded context. One good thing, uh, one nice way of trying to abstract what could be a bounded context in your code and what not. Every if every time you change a part of your bounded context, if you have to change any kind of code in another part of the system, usually it means that you have a bad abstraction, you have a bad bounded context. And But I like to think that, I don't remember who coined this term, but uh, things that change together stay together things that change separately stay apart. So it's a basic concept of modularity, and that's the same principle that we apply within bounded context, right? If we have a cohesive thing and we have like a coupling between the environments, probably that's a good candidate for a bounded context. And I'm going to create just an order, uh, bounded context. Uh, you can't use that for true because maybe, depending on the system that you're modeling, Order is not even an aggregate, could be other things. So I wish I could give you a better answer for that, but in what I've learned from domain driven design is that the most common thing that you can answer is it always depends, right? Is this one account? Well, it depends. Yeah? I have to understand the whole business model. So just take this as a very simple example, example, or even simplistic example, right? So suppose that order is an entity which also happens to be an aggregate. How do we model that in uh, Java? So if that's a business model, 
most of the entities, most of the aggregates, and most of the value objects, we want to store them in a persistent storage. And the most common way of storing objects in an enterprise information system is through relational database. That's why we're going to use some JP annotations and also because we want to stick to the Java E environments. So if you want to do that, JPA demands that is serializable. I also mean that need to be an entity. Remember, aggregates are, are, uh, are entities too. So they have an identity. And uh, once I had a complaint that saying, well, you shouldn't be, if you think about, uh, if you read clean code, if you follow Uncle Bob, which I love to, but um, Uncle Bob, I think, is taking the, the, the opposite approach. Uh, the older he gets, the more dogmatic he's becoming. So I don't know. I think as the older we get, the more pragmatic should we become, right? We just understand that the world is not black and white. And many people complain that, well, you should not be polluting your business model with this technology-specific annotations. And I, I tried both approaches in the past. And uh, I have to tell you that creating an unfit corruption layer, uh, which is a layer that you add on top of your, on top or below your model, trying to avoid uh, leaking some uh, implementation-specific abstractions to your code. In this particular case of JPA, I think it's not worth it, right? Uh, and another technical term of anti-corruption layer, some people advocate that your business domain model must be pristine, that your business domain model classes shouldn't, shouldn't change. So if today you're using JPA and tomorrow you want to use MongoDB, which might be a bad choice, or if you're using another kind of persistent storage, you shouldn't need to change a single line of your business domain model, okay? Some people advocate for that. And to be able to do that, you just create an, an anti-corruption layer, which uh, in another term, some people are discussing in the domain design world what we call hexagonal architecture. And anti-corruption layers uh, fit on the adapter abstraction in this kind of architecture. So basically we have a set of classes. We create an adapter layer that translates these concepts to implementation specific concepts, okay? Uh, but again, uh, at least for JPA, most of the times I just realized that it wasn't worth it because it ends up that you create, even if you have like enterprise information systems are like abstraction beasts because you have a lot of information that must be implemented on the model. And if you do that, if you create an anti-corruption layer, you just have just simply have to mirror all of your entities and value objects into another layer with the same attributes same relationships just for the purpose of not uh, uh, adding some annotations in your domain model. So the pragmatic way that I think as of today is to add the uh, annotations in your business domain model. And another thing from the domain driven design from Eric Evans is don't fight the framework, right? So we should be pragmatic. If the cost of trying to avoid the framework is too high, you just stick, well, that's an architectural decision, stick to the technology that you choose and make some trade-offs about that. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I have an entity. So basically, if you want to model an entity, many people think maybe I should have an ID and I just add an ID, I just add a generated value. Maybe I should be using uh, a number Right, maybe my order should have like some items because order should be composed of many items. Maybe I should have a list or something. Let's create an order item. Items and this. okay. And just import it and that's the basic class. Many people would just create getters and setters right now just to expose all of the URL abstraction uh, which defeats the purpose of trying to encapsulate your code. Right, And uh, so in many of the teams that I was able to work with, I always tell them, you should never generate your getters and setters. You should carefully see if you need to expose some kind of information to the outer world. So getters in the Java language, because of the Java Bean specification, is mostly unavoidable. But the setters, you should be thinking very carefully about what you're doing. Okay, but so we can do better than that. We don't need to generate all of these getters and setters we can improve what 
we're doing. Some of the discussions around uh, domain driven design saying we're, we're trying to add some value objects. So if you think, do I allow any kind of long to be an ID to my order? Maybe if you have a special requirement for the generation of orders in your system, uh, you need like, you can't, it can be negative, can't be zero, or you want your order IDs to be printed in a very specific format to the user. So do you, want, do you don't want numbers that if you require 10 digits, you don't want to start with a zero or do you don't want like two consecutive, consecutive more than two consecutive numbers, uh, which are the same. So this might be some restrictions. Then, then you might be thinking, should it be an ID, which is, is an internal uh, information, or should I create another concept for, for the external ID uh, information? So that's one of the discussions. Number, order number. Uh, do I allow any number to be an order number? It, can it be? If, same discussion, can it be zero? Can it be negative? Can it be no? So another issue. Order item, the first attempt that we might, might want to do is that, well, it, magically, you just realize that order has one or more items. So automatically, let's create a one-to-many relationship to try to, to map all of them. And if any, well, most of us Java developers are more experienced people. And uh, I talk a lot about microservices and lately I've, uh, with data distributed problems. I've been talking also about secure S and event sourcing. And I think one of the issues, especially more experienced people, to not say older, have, is that when we learned how to model our systems, we had like very database centric uh, uh, people, and so we learn it when we, th we were thinking about systems. We first learned that uh, to think about which are the entities of our systems and which are the properties that each one of those entities have, right? So I think that most of us still have that in your mind. When you think about the system, the system has order, has customer, has shipping, has discount, and you just start adding properties, then, well, here I have a one-to-many association, here I have, I have a, I have a many-to-many -many association, here I have a one-to-one -one association. And, it, uh, and now that we're in the 2018, now that most of people are considering distributed system, this approach hurt us very much. Because if we're talking about distributed systems, it's much easier for us to model a system if we think first about the behavior of the system, meaning, uh, which events happens on the system first, rather than thinking about data structure first, right? So this hurts, this hurts uh, us a bit, but it's not something that we'll be able to change that from one day to the other. But if we're talking, uh, if you're used to think about the structure of the data first, you might be thinking that order should be an entity too. Oh, I already created this class. Let's get back. How did I do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I forgot to delete my classes. Order. Yeah, this one is ready. Let's just delete that. Sorry, that's what, you, what happens when you practice a bit before. Right, so here, let me create my class. Create class order item. Again, if that's an entity implement serializable, I can add an entity. And you guess that if you're using JPA, if you have an entity, you need an ID, you have to add an ID too. And it keeps adding up to the same thing. Another temptation that many Java developers have when you're creating your entities is, is that, well, if all of the entities, they have an ID, then why don't I put the ID on a super abstract class and just add a method super class and everybody extends for that, which uh, for me proved to be a very bad way of trying to model your things because in domain-driven design terminology, you shouldn't be using this uh, primitive type for ID, so we're going to change that later. 
Uh, if you have an order item, should be an order item ID. If I have an uh, order, should be an also order ID because it will help us to de to determine our bounded context later. And, but it's specifically on the order item, in most of the systems that I modeled in the past, I also, uh, also created that as an entity. But in uh, at least on the two or three recent systems that I implemented before joining Red Hat. I thought that, well, order item, is that an entity or a value object? If you have an order item, an order item usually has the quantity, has the product, has well, the value, the monetary value of that item in, in my order. If I create another object which has the same product, the same quantity, and the same value, is it different from the other one? Or is it the same thing? It has the same meaning, right? at least in most of the system. So if you ask these questions about domain-driven design modeling, you just realize that order item shouldn't be an entity, but should be a value object. And you thought that it wasn't possible for you to create these uh, associations with from one entity that has many value objects, but with JPA 2.0, I guess, we were able to uh, do that. So instead of entity, you can create an embeddable element. So you're creating value objects even with a one-to-many association. And then with Hibernate, it was possible to do before, but JPA, uh, I guess it wasn't available on the first version. So if you have an embeddable element, you don't need an ID anymore you don't, because these objects don't have identity. And uh, if you have a one-to-many association between order and order item, it means that you have, if you add an order item, you have to explicitly ask JPA to persist your item. If you remove your item, like it's not on the list anymore, you have to explicitly go and delete their order item too, so that your association becomes correct on the database. If you're using embeddable, Hibernate and JPA automatically manages the relationship for you. So if you remove an object from the list, it's removed from the database too. And if you replace an order item, with another copy, you also update the database correctly. Uh, uh, one person complained about you know, with me about that. Well, but uh, if you do embeddable, it's not a well-performed operation because every time you update the order, uh, Hibernate in this case has to simply delete all the elements on the database and insert all of them again. Yes, I'm aware of that, but if you think that uh, if, if the collection of elements is small enough, it shouldn't matter in your implementation, right? You, sh you won't have a bottleneck because of that. But on the other hand, if you have many items on the order, you mo should be thinking about uh, domain-driven design. If you have like one order and you have like thousands of items in that order, you should be thinking if your business model is not a special case, and maybe order item shouldn't even be an entity. Maybe it's a, even another bounded context, okay? So that's a, some of the discussions that you should be having, but for most of the cases, order item can be a value object. And how do you create a value object? So value objects are immutable, which I forgot to tell you uh, before. Entities change over time, value objects are immutable. The way for you to create an immutable object in Java, if I have here, I'll just create a string because for simplicity reasons, I have string products. Make I have a final integer. Amount. Maybe I have a value. And if I want to do that, of course, JPA will complain because we don't do that well with final. So the best way that I found to do that is that you can create final immutable objects without the final keyword if you just don't allow them to change over time. So what can you do? Well, we can create the getters, but we should not create the, the setters, right? And, I, and uh, if you don't create a setters, so when you, whenever you create a value object, it, uh, the values will remain that forever. So you must have a way of passing this, these values to your your, your object creation. First approach is to create a constructor. So if I create a constructor with all of that, JPA mandates that you create a default constructor, 
uh, uh, constructor because most of the time it just instantiates with new instance and then populates with a reflection. But that should be an implementation detail, not something that you're going to explore in your code. So here you're going to have to create a, a default constructor with empty values. JPA specification mandates that is protected, but if you're using Hibernate, you can use a default scope because it's uh, it's better encapsulated, right? So out of package, you won't have, have access to that. So it really depends if you're using Hibernate or not. But let's just stick with plain old JPA. Uh, I don't like to use uh, constructors. I think that's one of the bad things. Oh, bad things, no, bad. It's my taste that I dislike constructors in my code, so I always prefer to use factory methods. So the nice thing about that, I can, I can always refactor. So if you have most modern IDEs, they have a refactor and replace with factory method. It's just of my taste that I prefer to use of as the name of my factory method. And you might be wondering, why should I be using a factory method instead of constructor? First, if you're using a constructor, you are constrained to create it an object of that specific type. If you have, uh, if you use off, you can return objects that are not of type or well, that are not exactly of class or their item, but you can return any uh, uh, children of or their items. So you can extend a subclass, you can add this behavior too. So this is one of uh, uh, of the advantages. Other advantages are that in some use cases. If the cost of calculating uh, um, the creation of the object, or if your object is too big, it's holding too much memory, and since it's a value object is immutable, you can implement the flyaway pattern directly here in your factor method. So this is one of the benefits of using a factor method, and I also believe that the syntax is better. Right? If you're creating an object, you should never allow your object to have an inconsistent state. And since we're using a factor method, this consistent state must be enforced on object creation. So how do we do that? You can create your own utility classes. I like to use Guava, which many people bash me for that. But the Guava guys, they promised that, that uh, starting on version 22 or something, they will not break backward compatibility anymore okay so we still have to check if that's true because guava is very known in the especially for library maintainers to break things like guava 18 had one method guava 19 does the same thing with another method and since many people use guava in their libraries sometimes in your project you need guava 18 but you also need guava 15 and they're incompatible right so we have a very nice problem uh, if using two different versions, but we expect it to be solved. That's what I read, I read on, the, on the mailing list, at least. Uh, that was the direction. They would not break backward compatibility anymore, or if they would clearly announce that they would be breaking something like that. But, so I like to use Guava when I know that it's not going to create any problems for me. So we can use some great utility methods like check not no, product should not be no, uh, amount should not be no too. I should be using that, should not be new. So I can uh, enforce here that I won't, will never have a no value in my class. I also can check if my argument is amount should be greater than zero. That's another way for me to check. And you might be thinking that, uh, did you say that you shouldn't be using primitive ties or, some, or something like that? Yes, product, amount, and value should be other value objects too. But since I don't have like four hours to be showing you right now, you have to forgive me. In this specific case, I'll be using primitive values. So now that I've ensured that all of my values are correct and the, I've set that in my constructor. I can expose some kind of information because again, Java requires that most of the times. I can create my getters and expose this information.
Okay? Just because I know that the string, integer, and big decimal are immutable, right? But in a real world, I would have to implement proper uh, uh, product. Uh, could be, uh, I could be creating a product class and uh, add a reference here. This could be a many to one association. So, but again, it depends, but in most business scenarios, I have an order. So I have a part of my system that is handling the orders. And I also have products. Usually it is not a uh, responsibility of the order system to be dealing with the products because another module of the system is responsible for inserting the products that I have in your system. And very much likely another part of the system procurement should be responsible for buying the products that somebody put in the system and checking how much do I have in my inventory, okay? So product here, very typical for Java developers to just add a many to one relationship to the product. Uh, but then if you model that properly in domain driven design, you just realize that the product is a different bounded context and you should never reference e entities from other bounded contexts in your code. And how do you do make, do you perform this association? Is that you're only allowed to reference entities or better that. You're only allowed to reference aggregates from other bounded contexts in your bounded context by ID. So the only class that you would be able to reference here in the order item would be product ID, and it's not a relationship. Okay, that's what you would you do in a real world product uh, project. But since I'm, I need to simplify that a bit. I'm just going to stick with string. Let's get back to order. Here, I created an order item, so I can add what uh, should be a one-to-many relationship, but since I'm using an embeddable object in JPA, now I can use element collection, and it solves all the problems that I mentioned before, right? So, oops, sorry. I saw that, that I chose the wrong. Yeah, I don't want a JDO annotation if somebody ever used that. Okay. So element collection. What else? Number shouldn't be also a, a, a primitive object. Maybe I should create a proper value object order number. So let's try to create a class order number. Order number again. If that's a value object, this one is, should be simpler. It's realizable. Internally, I might want to store that as int or an integer. Uh, should be final. Again, maybe I should want to create a constructor. If that's a constructor, maybe I want to create a factor method. And if I want to do that as a factor method, maybe I want to check that it's not null. And I want also to check the argument that value is greater than zero or greater than a thousand. It really depends on how do you going to implement that. And do I need to provide a, a get value? I don't think so, or else I'm leaking the internal representation of my object. What I could be doing here uh, otherwise is that maybe I want to create a two string representation. And also see many people using two string representations as a way for showing the user uh, this order number information. Uh, the, the practice that I follow right now is that true string is useful if you're debugging, if you're creating your log statement, you should not be leaking business representations or true string methods. That's why I prefer to use from Guava, for example, more objects, true string helper, this, and I just add value, add value. And then I can add to string here, okay? Because if I want to provide business information to my end user, there's another Java interface that not many people are aware of, which is formatable, which allows you to use a formatter. So you can just implement this matter, methods formatter. And what you do, well, here I simply want to print a number, but if you, if you ever use it, system.printf, uh, uh, output string.printf, you can just use format. I could say that I want to add just as a simple digit 
and I want value. You might be thinking, well, I want to, all of the digits to have at least four, four, four digits, and I want that if it's low, low it has, if it has leading zeros, I want them to be shown up, so you can could use all of the formatting capabilities of the Java library, okay? And if you want internationalization, that's the place you should be doing that too, okay? Uh, basic internalization, internationalization, at least. If you have more advanced features, maybe you should be abstracting that into a different class, but for basic internationalization, you can use here. Uh, what else can we show? Usually order number, if you want to sort them out, maybe you want to implement comparable, and you want to be then comparable to other order numbers, so you can implement this interface too. And if you want to do that, maybe you want to use a comparison chain. Start, compare, this dot value, or dot value, dot results. Yes, so that's a nice way for you to, to be comparable. And it also happens a lot. I saw that you have some stickers, some joke stickers here too, uh, which is a very powerful tool for you to be creating DSLs for queries. So it's very common in domain driven design applications for you to create secure IS objects for queries. Joke is one of the libraries that is very useful for that. I, in the, I never used Joke. So in my previous projects before joining Red Hat, I always used another library called Kiri DSL, which happens to be an open source library maintained by a Finnish guy, Timo West. So I don't know which is the status of the project right now, but that's the library that I've been using. And uh, specifically for Kiri DSL, if you implement the comparable interface in your value objects, it's very useful when you're using the DSL to create your queries, right? I can't answer for joke, but I'm pretty sure that if somebody tweets to Lucas Eder, he'll be more than happy to start a flame war and answer that, okay? So, I'm kidding, he's a great guy, okay? <laughs> and uh, yes, that's the basic that you could do in a value object, so. Uh, Okay. Or yes. Uh, if you, uh, the, the practice that I follow is that if creating business domain objects in your model, I always use the class and not the privilege type. Why is that? Because databases, database fields can be null, right? And uh, uh, you have like a mismatch if you have the primitive value and do that, but uh, uh, it used to be a best practice before domain driven design. And uh, now that we, well, I'm going to show another feature of JPA 2.0, which are the attribute converters. After that, it became less relevant, but even if, if you're using the attribute converters, it's easier because JDBC drivers always create the box of the representations. Mm -hmm. So it's just, or else you have to only convert it to keep the uh, integer dot int value. And uh, so, uh, I guess that's the reason why I use that, okay? Now it's not a requirement. In the past, it used to be. I don't know how many of you spent like days trying to, trying to find a bug just because somebody added int to uh, an entity and then somebody, I don't know why, got into the database console, console and added a new value to a certain row. And then when you have a query, that, that, that row is not even your results that you're showing to the user, but your code doesn't work. And it, sh it, sh it used to show a no pointer exception in like one of the hibernate statements, and you have absolutely no idea why it happened. That's why I prohibited anybody on my team at the time when we found out why to use primitive values in the business objects. But I guess that it's less relevant today. But 13 years ago, it was very relevant, okay? okay. May I have another question? Mm -hmm. uh, why there is not a uh, web of perspective in this class? Oh, right. 
because this is a, a pure value object representation that is going to be stored as a field and not as a relationship. I don't know if that's clear. But the other one here, order, is not because I want, but because that's the JPA limitation. Okay? Order item is, in our business model, it's a value object, right? But JPA is going to store that as a relationship. In the implementation model, there in the database, it's going to create a separate table and it's going to add a relationship between them. Yeah. So JPA, when it uh, restores the objects from the database, it just needs to create empty objects and it uses class.new instance. So that's why you need a default constructors at the iteration process, it injects through reflection. Yeah. So that's a JPA demands di this for uh, uh, values that are abstracted as rows, okay? But it doesn't require that for values that are stored as columns, okay? Right. Uh, I used this approach in the past, but uh, it's nice that you have mentioned a hash code. I forgot that. Order number should have a hash code too. You always implement this, uh, equals and hash code. And why should I be doing that? Uh, it will save you some lines of code. Uh, but again, in the past, I thought it wasn't worth it. Uh, for the cost of adding a comma abstraction that will be extended through all the entire system. So my uh, current thinking is that I prefer to implement equals and hash code into one of them. And to do that, I just use <coughs> the Guava helpers, even though in, in Java, uh, Java 7 or 8, I think, they added the object class to help that. So. So I just e object oops. instance of for the number for the number. So I just cast return objects equal Java Utu this dot value other dot value. Okay. And hash codes. So I couldn't find, I, I tried many, well, you could use have reflection to implement this part in an abstract class. I just thought that it's not worth. And depending on which kind of ordering, again, with the current machines, I don't think it matter. But using reflections for a big inset memory and trying to sort them used to take some time 13 years ago, right? Right now it doesn't matter that much, but that's one of the reasons I, I prefer to tap the code because at that time reflection was really costly. Okay. So yes, uh, value object should always implement equals and hash code. In this case, equals is not that relevant because since I'm implementing comparable, every time I try, I would try to sort or something like that. Java code, we use the, the, the compare to value anyway. That's another source of bugs. You implement equals, but you also implement, implement uh, comparable, and your sorting order is wrong, and you just keep you looking at where, or you, you try to check if the objects are equal, and it, they don't match, just, just because of the comparable interface, right? And it's not enough to emphasize that. I'm just coding this all on the fly. You should have your unit test for everything but that's something that I expect everybody is doing or not, right? No, it's just an equals method, yeah? Okay. You have see bigger problems because of that. And why, well, equals simple, why I choose to implement a unit test? 
because it's very easy to do it wrong, right? That's, that should be reason enough for you to, to implement the unit tests. So I just created here order number and let me implement. Okay, order number, maybe it needs to be exposed to the interface, so maybe I need to create a, a, a getter. But again, items, maybe I need to expose that information. Maybe no, because of the Java frameworks that we have and the Java bean specification. Most, if not all of the time, you have to expose your internal collection to the outer world. So it's not an option. But the problem with this implementation is that list is a mutable class. So if you're exposing, we're just leaking our internal representation. And it's a bread pret. That's why, again, I like to use the Guava classes, copy off items. And since order item is immutable and uh, this list inst instance is immutable, I'm guaranteeing that nobody outside my class is capable of changing any value of my object representation, right? So because another goal of domain driven design is try to fight that anemic domain model. We want to add richness to, um, to our code. We want to add behavior and not just plain containing containers for information. So we should be adding something like this. Another way, um, another thing that I could do, maybe I have some order, different types of order. I have a normal order, I have a special order, or I have a discounted order, which change this behavior or change the information that I display to the system. Maybe it can affect the, the shipping. Uh, it can give a discount to the shipping, or maybe have, if you're prime users, maybe you have free shipping for two-day delivery. So maybe I want to add a type, which is nice to see. Uh, I don't know, I could have a type here. Uh, anybody tried that? If you order something when you're a Prime member and your membership expires and the order has not, has still not been delivered, do you pay for the shipping or not? Nobody tried this corner case? Okay, maybe you shouldn't renew automatically your membership and try this corner case. I think I'll do that. My membership expires next month. So maybe you have a type, and if you have a limited set of values that you have a type, the best class for doing that in Java is, of course, enum. How do you say in Italian? Enum? Enum? Or enum? Enum? Just like in Portuguese, okay? Order type, so maybe you have a normal normal, maybe you have a prime uh, order type, so two different behaviors, and I don't know, maybe you have a different string that you want to show your end user, your interface. Uh, in a proper internationalized system, you wouldn't be adding your business string here in the type, you would be adding just a key to be look, look it up somewhere else, probably in a properties file. But we want to oversimplify things, so I want to add some information in my order type. So maybe I want to add final string, uh, external string. So I could do that and uh, you can add a constructor saying that I want the, the external string and I could add this, well, normal, saying that this is a normal order, order and maybe here it could be a prime member order. So I'm adding some behavior. In this case, I could add a getter because it doesn't break my encapsulation. Uh, but that's just the basic way of handling that. Uh, one of my enums are now, or enums, okay? Are one of, it's my favorite type in Java because it's so powerful. It can do a lot of things for you. Limited instantiability, guaranteed serialization and all of this kind of stuff. But I, the specific use case that I love about enums or enums are uh, added behavior because usually we just use enums for, for containing information or if you want to switch operations, we just do that using switch statements. Uh, I like to implement behavior in enums and uh, uh, some people also ask how much behavior should I add to, uh, to, uh, uh, to a, um, a type like this? I also like to think if you can add enough behavior that it can be contained in a single screen, 
you should be adding here. If it's too much behavior, then maybe you should be creating specific implementation classes for that, because it's just that uh, it's, just, it's just a strategy pattern anyway. So how can I do some behavior? So let's see. Suppose that if somebody gives me a value, uh, normal orders just get the straight value and prime orders will have 10% uh, discount by default. And let's suppose also that's the only behavior that I would want to switch with, with type for now. So it's another software evolves or implement right now with a function. From big decimal to big decimal. Decimal. Oh, come on. Right? So we used to do that. Uh, I used to implement the interface directly on the type before, but since Java 8, with all of the lambdas, the requirement for implementing directly uh, uh, got lower, got a lower priority, because on these days, instead of implementing that, and just add the behavior here, which you think it's a very nice way for you to show that you're smart, because not many people are aware that you can extend enums, enums uh, like this way. But uh, with Java 8, you can simply just add the function as uh, instead of implementing the interface here directly, uh, it has became, become a much more common approach for you to just add a field with the behavior that you want, okay? So now you can, we can abstract this information a function, big decimal, so, uh, discount, okay, so yes, it became much easier for you to implement this way, instead of extending this way, you just have to add this, uh, add constructor parameters, you would just add this, and here, you have to create, well, normal is just a normal half of a value. I just return the plain value. But here, if I have a discount order, I can say the, uh, multiply 0 0.9, okay? Oops. Okay. Uh, I guess that with Java 8, this syntax become much better than implementing directly on the enum. So that's, and how do you do that? Would you get this information? Well, you get this count, okay? You just get a function and you apply that in your Java code. That's one of, uh, I think that this is the best approach for handling this kind of behavior right now. But if you have like multiple different implementations, it's not just discount, maybe you have shipping costs, maybe you have special uh, other kinds of behavior that uh, uh, vary greatly about that. You could be, uh, then I guess I won't have time to show that, but maybe you could have a specific factory classes for each one of the functions. You could have a shipping factory function, or oh, shipping function factory, uh, that's one name, or you could have many other factories. And you could also be implementing a map, like uh, to try to implement the type of here, type of factory. It, it's, it's some of the things that you could, could be doing by code if your complexity grows out of this single class, right? But if you have a simple use case, this one should be more, more than enough for you to solve this problem. Let's get back to order. How do we do with this, how do we deal with this value objects uh, regarding the interface and the database? Uh, before that, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Anybody hungry? Uh, I am, okay? That's why I'm asking. So, okay, let me just uh, deal with the new problem here and, and, and call it a wrap. Uh, how do I uh, store this order number abstraction into my database? Luckily for us, I think I didn't even delete that, so it's already here. Right? So I have uh, order number attribute converter JPA 2.0 brought us the attribute converter abstraction and it was improved in JPA 2.1 because uh, if your database had no values or if your entities had no fields, the attribute converter wouldn't be called. 
So even if you wanted to avoid with some new pointer exception by spreads in your code, unfortunately, because of this, you would still get a no value. Um, I'll get back, uh, get back to this later. But now since JP 2.1, this class is called even if you have no fields or no values in your database. And how does it work? It translates value objects to your database and the opposite true. If you want this to be applied in all of the instances of your order number, like you implement this like implements, attribute converter, your value object, which is order number, and with the basic JDBC type that you want it to have when stored into the database. So I want to be stored as an integer, uh, uh, integer JDBC mapping. If I want that to be applied in all of the instances, uh, so I don't have to, uh, to keep adding uh, an uh, add annotation in all of the occurrences of that, I just add add converter, auto apply true. And you have to implement two methods, which basically are convert to database column and you give an order number and you get an instance of the attributes and convert to entity attributes. You get a value from the database and you just check here. Okay. Be aware that order number dot of this method checks if you have a new value, right? So if somebody, somebody, the DBA just got a new value into your database and you try to create an instance of that in your application, you have an exception here automatically. Right? So you're guaranteeing that whenever you read from the database, from JPA 2.1 forward, uh, you're guaranteeing that you never read a new value from the database because you get an exception right here. If that's that constraint that you want, but I think that's a bad idea to have no attributes anyway. And here, convert to database column. We know that the internal representation of order number is an integer but we don't want to leak that to my, the rest of the code or show that to the, uh, to, to the outer world. So order number, how do I get this value? Uh, first thought was, well, maybe value, why don't we create a get value, right? I think this is a bad choice because whenever we see a value uh, string, we think that it's tied to the internal representation and we're just saying to the world that I'm using integer internally in my class. So I prefer to use this case. Uh, one approach that I could use is that I could add order number. Uh, instead of being private, I could give a default access and I could add the order number attribute converter on the same package, right? So it should be visible. I wouldn't need to create another method. I could access this information directly. Uh, after considering many different ideas in my mind today, I just prefer to, well, let's put that in separate packages because if you're using a layered architecture or if you're using an hexagonal architecture, the attribute converter is a non-corruption layer, should be separate. So that's why I prefer to put a private here and the attribute converter. We create a method, not get value, but I prefer to use two integer because it explicitly states that I'm converting an order number to another type of thing and not simply exposing some kind of information, right? So if I later, I, can, I could create two big decimal and nobody could complain about anything because the documentation should be stating something like that, okay? So I can create this method to integer. So if I, I just have to, to rename this and it uh, technically shouldn't break my encapsulation, okay? And to the code, if I want to use that in JSF, the same thing should be true. Uh, I have attribute converters for the database, but if I want to show this information in a form in, my, in JSF, I need to use a JSF converter. So JSF convert, JSF convert is specific to JSF, but any kind of view technology that we have today has the same concept, a converter, which in domain-driven design technology is basically an anti-corruption layer. You just get an object from your domain business model and exposing that to a technology implement, a specific implementation. Okay. So, and I didn't show, well, uh, let me try. 
I won't have time to code that, but let me get a ready example for you. View. Right? Usually in JSF, if you have a no attribute, if you have a form and somebody types a no thing into your interface, you get a no value in your form. So every time you want to use that field in your query, you also have to check. Well, if name is not no, then you get your query builder and you add, well, SQL from, well, where something equals to something. And if all of them are empty, then maybe you have no where clause, you just have a limit clause because you don't want to fetch the entire database. And you have to do that in all of the fields that you have in your form, right? You have to add this if different than no statement to check for that. So one of the approaches that we could be using for that is uh, optional, which some people love and some people hate. But before using optional, I think that uh, optional is useful for some use cases. Uh, for the other use case, I think that the best approach is to use a new object. So basically what we're creating here, I just created an interface, single string argument, which gets a string from the web interface. And the if different than no uh, behavior is implemented on this class, single string argument dot off. I said it's an interface, in fact, is a class, okay? Single string argument, that's an instance which implements the behavior. Another way for you to think about that is that usually, uh, 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 what am I doing here? I'm getting name, which is an instance of single string argument, and I'm saying name append your where part of the query to this uh, query builder. A Boolean builder is a query builder from a query that cell. I'm pretty sure Joke has a similar concept, just change the name of the class. So basically you have a query builder. I'm just asking my class to append your information to this guy. And if that's a new instance, it basically will do nothing. If it has any value, it will add the where clause to the, to the thing, okay, to the query builder. And that's how you should do that's the, what is the name of the law? I forgot that, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that if you, if you Google uh, on, uh, or YouTube that, I said that in another version of the stock. Okay? I forgot the principle, sorry. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's because I'm hungry. Okay. And another thing that I wanted to show, what is that? And would you give me just five minutes because I want to show something? Here, because this one is a, a conclusion that I took uh, and uh, I think it's relevant. Some people also curse me because what I'm going to show right now is breaking the mirror's law, which means that if you have, if you have, if you receive an object as an argument, you should only be invoking uh, methods on the argument that you received and neither, neither on its dependencies. Some people are also, I'm one of that, those people, that Demeter's law is not a uh, law, but just a, a strong recommendation for doing that. Especially if you're using, using uh, if you're modeling business, uh, business objects, like order. I would say that 95% of the time that you have an order, you have to do something with the items. Right? And most of the time you have to show the user interface order, which is the total amount. Maybe you can create a secure S representation and other field for the total, or you can just interact for all the items for, to check for that. Okay? And maybe uh, in a simple model you have items, but maybe you want to have a history of unfulfilled items. Maybe you, you, want, you want to have another list of cancel items. Okay? and you want them to be stored on the same class, depends on how you model that. So sometimes you are just adding an element collection and if your business model allows, maybe you can use the same order item class. You can just here or unfulfilled. And maybe you could be also using that to cancel the items. Right. Maybe you could be using all of that. And if you strictly follow Demeter's law, 
if you want to to show to the end user total amounts, maybe you want the total amount of unfulfilled items, maybe you want the total amount of canceled items, maybe you want the total <coughs> the, the estimate delivery of all the unfulfilled items and the items that are were already shipped. So this is kind of behavior. And what happens to that? Then you start to have a total. You have the total of the items, you have the total of the unfulfilled items, and you have the totals of the cancel items. Uh, and you just keep adding all of these methods in your code, which all of them are very similar. The only thing that changes is the list on which they are applied. So it's certainly not uh, smart code, but it's code that is, gets repeated. You can't just find a, one simple abstraction because the field on the where they apply it changes. What do you do? I think that in this kind of use cases, it's much better for you to create another abstraction. And luckily for us, again, Guava allow us to do, we could create a class order items or order item lists. Um, uh, I'm not sure about which name I could choose. I've been using order item, even though order item lists sound for me just as bad. Order items is a plural, which breaks some concepts that we have. But saying that it's a list also ties me to, to the implementation, right? So if tomorrow I want to change to a set, I just said that it's a list. So my current choice, I prefer to name order items, even though I think it shouldn't, but it's better than saying that it's a list, okay? And extends, I can forward in list from Guava, and I can also add the, add the order item, the type here. You're just saying they must have a delegate. I'm saying private final or list order item value. I add a constructor and I should be refactoring to uh, factor methods. Of course, I should check, check not, no value here and return value. That's the basic implementation. You might be tempted, you should be implementing equals hash code to string all of that. And if you want to add, if you want to know the total amount, maybe you could just add the public big decimal, get total. And just say that return value of stream dot map I've had an item get value map and certainly I want to reduce what do I do start with big decimal uh, big decimal dot zero and I want to add all of them right so you just did that you get value, I uh, complained that I could be using a method reference. I get the value, I add all of them starting from zero. And then when I go back to my order, instead of having here list from order and everything else could be new order items. Or off. Which I should also be creating uh, uh, a default factory method, just but out of time. And when I say that I'm exposing, or maybe you don't want to change even here, you can just create a plain new linked list and say that, well, I just want to expose information as order items. And here is going to be an order items of items. Okay. What I did forgot to do is that here should be uh, immutable implementation. Okay, order. So now I'm just going to add here order of and say the order get items get total. This method sh should work. And as also if I add another get unfulfilled items of 
just as much as it should work for order get unfulfilled items get total get total it's not working because the type here should be order items okay it's just complaining because it's no but that's the kind of behavior that I wanted to add and in Pratt's uh, and the systems that I did that I think it helped it a lot but again with the problem that everybody that sees the code just complain oh you're breaking the meters law I know I did it on purpose because I thought that the opposite way wasn't worth it and I added this kind of behavior in the item because I still think that it is better to do this I think I have less code it's less error prone uh, uh, to do this then doing just just exponential adding methods directly on the order class okay so yes this is just a few of the things that I wanted to show I started writing a book about that uh, but usually I only have time uh, to to do things coding and writing when it's not conference season it, we're in the peak of the conference season, so I'm not, I didn't do anything in the past month, for example. But I hope to be, have it finished this year yet, and uh, to share this experience maybe another time here at Milan. And final message, we should be creating better software for a better world, but I think I emphasized enough that in the beginning. And all of this content is or will be available at developers.redhead.com. Your feedback is more than welcome. I'm always willing to accept new ideas, new concepts, new suggestions. The easiest way for reach me is with my Twitter handle at Yanaga. Uh, I reply faster. You can email me at Yanaga at redhead.com, but please be patient. Sometimes I take a lot of time to reply. I have one email that's making an anniversary here uh, that, I should, that I know I should reply, but I didn't have time because it's a big email and it requires a big answer too. And Thank you very much. Thank you. And my special request. Yeah. Yeah, if you could like <laughs> this, okay? Because I'll be doing that. I need to, to, to show that to my son. And another smiling. Hey. Thank you again.